Is it possible to make a supersonic jet fighter that is small, cheap, easy to maintain and still be able to deliver a punch? Sure. Hello aviators, how are you? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I'm an airline captain with interest for aviation history. In this video, I will tell a story about an aircraft that is close to my heart. And that is the Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter. As a 21-year-old conscript in the Royal Norwegian Air Force, I served as a photographer at the 336 Squadron at Trygge Air Base south of Oslo. The squadron was equipped with a F-5A fighter bomber, F-5B trainer, and the RF-5A reconnaissance aircraft. For an aviation geek and photo enthusiast like me, this was like heaven on earth. I never got the opportunity to fly the F-5, but next to the photo department there was a link trainer. It didn't have motion or visual systems, but I was allowed to use it when it was available. An instructor showed me how to start it up. And that's pretty much how I taught myself to fly. But more about this later. Northrop Corporation was founded by aviation pioneer Jack Northrop in 1939. And this was the third company to bear his name. And since I'm from Norway, I had to point out that Northrop's first customer was the Norwegian government. In March 1940, they ordered 24 N3PB seaplanes. Before the airplanes could be delivered, Nazi Germany had occupied Norway. The Norwegian government evacuated to the United Kingdom, and it was agreed that exiled Norwegian airmen would operate under the umbrella of the Royal Air Force. In April 1941, the Triti Norwegian squadron was activated and based on Iceland where they flew U-boat patrols with the N3PB. One of the aircraft is restored and can be viewed at the Norwegian Armed Forces Aircraft Collection at Oslo Airport. In 1953, NATO issued a requirement for a lightweight tactical fighter jet. This happened shortly after Northrop had hired Edgar Schmoed, I hope I pronounced it right, he was the chief designer of the North American P-51 and F-86. At that time, there was a trend that American fighters grew larger and larger and more and more complex. Schmoed ordered his team to reverse this trend. The goal was to create a small supersonic fighter with good performance, being simple, with high reliability and low maintenance cost and with the potential for growth. And that's exactly what they did. To use a metaphor from the auto industry, instead of copying big American muscle cars, Northrop made a Porsche 911. In order to make a lightweight fighter, Northrop needed an engine with a good thrust weight performance. The solution came with a General Electric J85 turbojet engine. With a weight of only 340 kilos, a diameter of 45 centimeters, and a length of 115 centimeters, the early variant of the engine could develop 2,000 pounds of thrust and nearly 3,000 with afterburner. If you were strong enough, you could easily carry the engine on your arm. It was that small. The new aircraft received two of those engines and was given the designation N-156. The design work started in 1954, if my sources are correct. They stood in many different configurations, including a delta wing and airplanes with podded engines. At that time, the US Navy had a requirement for a small fighter for the escort carriers. An off-drop proposed the N-156N, but in March 1956, the Navy retired the escort carriers and the need for a lightweight fighter faded away. 
But Northrop continued to develop the N156, and in 1956, Northrop had finalized two variants. The N156F single-seat fighter and the N156T advanced trainer. The fighter variant has a long pointed nose, air intakes at the wing roots, small trapezoid wings, all moving stabilizers and a single tail fin. The engines were installed in the tail. The trainer variant has two seats in tandem and the seats are staggered providing good forward visibility for the instructor. In 1955, the US Air Force issued a requirement for a supersonic trainer, and the year after they selected the N156T, which became the T-38 Talon. It was first flown in 1959, and after a successful test program, it entered service in 1961. Because of its performance, the T-38 was nicknamed the White Rocket, and believe it or not, in 1962, it set absolute time to climb records to 3,000, 6,000, 9,000 and 12,000 meters. The previous records have been set by the F-104 Starfighter. When the production ended in 1972, almost 1,200 talons had been built. It has trained tens of thousands of American and Allied pilots. And even today, 61 years later, it is still in service. This aircraft deserves a separate video. Despite the success with the T-38, the US Air Force showed no interest in Northrop's fighter variant. However, Northrop decided to continue to develop the N-156F as a private venture. And some of the changes they made are a larger air intake with a square splitter plate. Two, the brakes are supplied by the utility hydraulic system. The T-38 has only manual brakes. Three, maneuvering flaps or leading edge flaps. Four, leading edge root extensions, lurks. The last two modifications give the wings more lift at high angles of attack and makes the aircraft surprisingly agile, despite the wing area is slightly smaller than for a Cessna 172. The N156F got seven hardpoints, one under the fuselage, two under each wing, and one at each wing tip. Space was provided for two 20mm cannons in the nose. In 1958, Northrop received an order for three prototypes which would be evaluated in the Military Assist Program, MAP. This program was set up to supply less developed nations with a low-cost fighter. The first N-156F had its maiden flight on the 30th of July 1959. On that flight, it exceeded the speed of sound. A second prototype followed shortly after. During the flight test program, the N-156F demonstrated very good reliability and ease of maintenance. Despite it proved to be better than the F-100 Super Sabre in the ground attack role, the interest for the N-156F faded away. In 1961, the US Army evaluated the N-156F against the Douglas A4 Skyhawk and Fiat G91. But the Air Force didn't like that, they were jealous. So it was decided that the Army could not operate fixed-wing aircraft, only helicopters. In 1962, the Kennedy administration reviewed the need for a low-cost fighter and ordered the N-156F into production as the F-5A Freedom Fighter. The airplanes will be distributed to allies of the United States but they will be ordered via the U.S. Air Force and would carry U.S. Air Force serial numbers. Aerodynamically, the F-5 is an efficient aircraft. The most noticeable feature is the use of area rule. Area rule means that the fuselage is narrowed in the region of the wings to present a nearly constant total cross-section area to the airflow passing over the entire aircraft. 
And this coke bottle shape reduces the aerodynamic drag at transonic speeds. One of the first American fighters to implement area rule was the Convert F-102 Delta Dagger. The prototype had a straight fuselage and it was not able to break the sound barrier. When area rule was implemented, the aircraft had no problem exceeding the speed of sound. The F-5 was from the onset designed with the area rule and even the wingtip tanks follow this principle. The second feature is the maneuvering flap. It allows the aircraft to fly at a higher angle of attack, improving turning performance. And the third aerodynamic feature is the lurks. It creates a vortex that delays stall and produces more lift at high angle of attack. The F-5 was the first fighter with this feature and it has later been used on aircraft like the F-16, F-18, MiG-29 and Sukhoi-27. All this, combined with the low drag, makes the F-5 a nasty opponent in a dogfight, because it's so small that you might not see it until you have been shot down. Now, let's have a look at the first generation F-5s. After a production order had been issued, the third prototype was completed and designated via 5 a And the first two prototypes were upgraded to the same standard. The test program was successful and the aircraft demonstrated that it can be operated from unprepared airstrips. And for a short period of time, one of the aircraft had a nose scare with two wheels. The first customer to order the F5A was Tada Norway, followed by in alphabetical order Botswana, Canada, Ethiopia, Greece, Iran, Morocco, Netherlands, Philippines, South Korea, South Vietnam, Spain, Taiwan, Thailand, Turkey, and Venezuela. When the production ended in 1972, Northrop had manufactured 621 F5A models, 200 F5B and 86 RF5A. In addition, the fight was built in a license in Canada and Spain. The Canadian variant was often referred to the CF5, but the official designation was CF116A. The Dutch version was designated NF5A the Spanish version SF5A and the Venezuelan version VF5A. The Norwegian version was designated F5AG and it had a tail hook. The F5A is a small airplane. It's 14.4 meters long and has a wingspan of 7.7 .7 meters. The empty weight is 3660 to 80 kilos and the maximum takeoff weight is 9,379 kilos. The external pylons can carry a total load of 2,812 kilos. And each of the 20 mm cannons have a firing rate of 25 rounds per second. The magazine has a capacity of 280 rounds or 11 seconds continuous firing. The F5A is equipped with upgraded J85GE-13 engines, each developing 2,720 pounds force, or 12 kilonewton in dry power, and 4,080 pounds force, or 18 kilonewton with afterburner. Maximum speed in clean configuration is Mach 1.4 at 36,000 feet. Some aircraft were later modified to carry the AN-APQ-153 radar, which was developed for the F5E Tiger II. The F5B is the trainer variant. The first B models were ordered at the same time as the first A models. While the F5B looks similar to the T-38, it has all the same modifications as the F5A and has the same combat capabilities as the fighter version. The only exemption is that the cannons are removed. It might sound odd, but the two-seater is 10 inches or 25 centimeter shorter than the single-seater. 
the nose gear is also moved further forward. Northrop built 200 B models. In addition came the trainers produced in Canada and Spain. The Canadian variant was designated CF116D, I think D means dual. And they also made a Venezuelan version, they called the VF5D. The Dutch version was the NF5B and the Spanish version SF5B. The first flight took place on the 24th of February 1964. The airplane carried serial number 63, 8438. And after completing the test flights with the US Air Force, it would find its way to Thailand, where it was in active service until it was retired in 2007, 43 years after the first flight. It is now displayed at the Royal Thai Air Force Museum in Bangkok. The RF-5A was first flown in May 1968. Simply put, it's an F-5A with a new nose housing four KS-92 cameras. They use 70mm film and the magazine has a capacity of 100 feet, which should be about 500 images. The first RF-5A was delivered to Iran and followed by, in alphabetical order, Greece, Morocco, Norway, South Korea, South Vietnam, Thailand and Turkey. Twelve F-5A Freedom Fighters were modified by adding a removable air refueling probe on the left side, 40 kilos of armor plates under the cockpit and engines, and jettison-enabled pylons. They were designated F-5C, and in October 1965, they were flown to Vietnam in a program called the Skosi Tiger. The word Skosi is Japanese and means little. The little tigers performed well as fighter bombers in Vietnam and proved to be very easy to maintain. They showed a very high dispatch reliability and because of its small size, it was difficult to shoot down. On the negative side, the F-5 had a short range and the engine sucked in debris from the cannons when they were fired. After two months of intense operation, only one F-5C had been lost. Several F-5As were added to the unit in 1966. And during that year, six aircraft were lost to ground fire and two to engine failure. A year later, the remaining F-5s were transferred to the Republic of Vietnam Air Force, where they remained in service until the war ended in 1975. The F-5D should have been a two-seat variant of the F-5C, but it was never built. As I mentioned earlier, I got the opportunity to fly the F-5A link trainer. Without motion or visual system, it wasn't a fully-fledged simulator, but the purpose with it was to practice procedures, especially emergencies, not learning to fly. Apart from having flown hang gliders, this was my first experience as a pilot. And how is the F5 to fly? It is not to be straightforward and easy to fly. It is a stable ground attack platform, but it can also maneuver pretty well. The roll rate is, with those small wings, very swift. My first flight in the F5 link trainer was short but eventful. When you watch fighters flying their displays at air shows, you get the impression that they are in a 90 degrees bank. So I thought. And after successfully getting airborne, I banked the aircraft 90 degrees and pulled the stick fully aft. And the aircraft stalled and made a big simulated hole in the ground. Lesson learned. It's not possible to make a turn in 90 degrees bank because there is no vertical lift vector. But you can reduce the bank to 80 degrees and you can maintain your altitude by pulling close to 6G. 75 degrees, you need only 4G. A fun exercise was to find out how much altitude I can gain in a loop. 
So I started at high speed at very low altitude and pulled up as gentle as possible. At the highest point, I reached about 10,000 feet, if I remember correctly. And when the nose started to point down again, I gradually increased the back pressure on the stick. And when I leveled out, I had uh, gained 3,000 feet. I also tried to fly inverted, but the engines flame out after about 10 seconds, because the fuel supply will be cut. The biggest challenge for me was to land at the airport. I understood the distance information, but I had no idea about how to use the directional guidance. To find my position, I trimmed the aircraft hands off, jumped out of the cockpit and checked a large map outside the link trainer. The map was covered by a glass plate where that pen was drawing a line as the flight progressed. And when I knew my position, I knew the heading I had to fly to get back to the airport. I found the aircraft to be a bit unstable on approach. It tended to oscillate up and down. A pilot told me it's better in real life. And based on my limited experience and what other pilots are saying, the F5 is easy to fly and to land, but you have to be very accurate. The video you are seeing here is from a low-level training flight in Norway. I'm not exaggerating when I say that Norwegian fighter pilots, they know every single rock. And that's all for this time. A second video is in the making and will cover every button in the cockpit. And a very special walk around. Please support my channel by sharing with your friends and all that. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. And happy learning.